of Extension program. And it, it introduces or supports the needs of farm women by providing education on pertinent topics and connecting them with um, agricultural resources across the state and nationally. Typically, and in the past, we have hosted one day conferences or, or a series of conferences, but due to COVID, we haven't been able to. And so last year, we started hosting these coffee chats, online coffee chats, and we're gonna continue doing that through March on the second Monday of every single month through March. And I'll go through some of the topics that we're gonna be reaching at the end of the session but just kind of wanted to let you know that we were kind of doing this and there might be some local and regional ones too. So I hope that if you haven't already, you will register for the ones that are upcoming. And again, I will go through that. So I hope everybody can hear me okay. And before I start the program, I just wanted to say that if you did have any questions to please use the chat to write those questions and we will be recording those and we will answer that at the end of Jerry's um, presentation. So with that, I would like to introduce Lee Presley, who is the county educator in Racine and Kenosha County, and she will be introducing Jerry, um, our present presenter. So with that. Awesome. Thanks, Jenny. So as Jenny mentioned, my name is Lee Presley. I'm uh, helping to moderate the conversation today. I am the Extension Agent in Racine and Kenosha County. And before we get started, we do have a little interactive activity, which is some egg trivia um, based on Wisconsin's agricultural history. So it's gonna get you warmed up for the topic. So I am going to run an on-screen poll with these questions. And um, I assume that we'll probably have a number of people get uh, the questions right. So those folks will be placed in a random drawing to receive one of three prizes. So we've got a copy of Jerry's book, um, A History of Wisconsin Agriculture, and then two American Girl Dolls. So um, we will announce the winners and um, email you um, after the program to kind of get your contact information and send those out to you. So with that, I am going to run a poll. So you should be seeing shortly here a um, a trivia poll. So we're going to have just take a few minutes and uh, give it your best answer. And I will share the results and announce the um, correct answers and then we'll move on with Jerry's presentation. So I'm gonna give it maybe one minute and it seems like a lot of responses are coming in here, so. Okay, so it looks like most of you who have wanted to vote have voted. So I am going to end the poll. And let's see how everyone did. Okay, so uh, before Wisconsin became America's dairy land, this was Wisconsin's major agricultural product. And the answer for that is wheat. Uh, Jerry might be kind of going over some of that history later. Um, this style of barn was popularized, popularized by German immigrants to Wisconsin, and that is the bank barn, which is kind of the traditional um, barn that you see around Wisconsin that has a bank leading up to the um, hayloft area. Uh, the number of dairy cows in Wisconsin was highest in this year. The answer for that is 1940, surprisingly. So um, that's just a little teaser for Jerry's presentation. I'm going to stop the share and with that, we're going to get started with Jerry's presentation. He is our featured speaker for the day. Um, we're going to spotlight his video so you can all um, see him speaking, and I'm going to unspotlight myself. So Jerry, you likely all know, is a renowned Wisconsin rural historian, a prolific author, 
and speaker, and most importantly, once an extension agent uh, like myself. So take it away, Jerry. Well, thank you so very much, and uh, good morning to everyone on a uh, November day that feels a whole lot like uh, maybe October. Uh, and I'm so pleased that all of you are uh, uh, tuning in uh, to, to uh, listen to what I have to say this morning. I, I must, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reminiscing now a little bit, but I started as an extension agent in 1957, which is a lot of years ago, in Green Lake County. And from there, I spent uh, some time in Brown County as well before uh, moving to, uh, to Madison. But today, we're going to be talking about the history, a little bit of the history of women in agriculture. And it's a fascinating history. And for those of you that want to go further and read more about what I'm talking about today, uh, you might get a hold of this book called Wisconsin Agriculture uh, History that I wrote a couple of years ago. There's a section in here uh, specifically on the topic of, of women uh, in agriculture. Well, what I want to do this morning, and there'll be opportunity, as mentioned, for some questions at the end, but I want to first talk about what women's lives on the frontier were all about way back into the 1830s and, and 40s. And then I'll say something about women's role in creating the dairy industry, which is also really kind of interesting. And then finally, I thought it might be of interest to all of you, uh, and then I'm an old guy, so I remember a lot of this stuff growing up as a kid on the farm. I selected the year 1940 just before, just, be, just ahead of World War II. And in that year, I want to share with you what my mother's activities were on the farm. So to get started, uh, I want to share a little bit first about women's lives on the frontier. And I want to read a little bit from what I have in the book. The life of a frontier woman was especially challenging. She dispensed medicines which were there when there was illness. She served as a midwife when babies were due, and perhaps most importantly, made sure that her family was well fed. She cared for the children, was responsible for the vegetable garden, took care of a small flock of chickens and sewed, washed, and mended the family's clothes. She milked the family's cow or two, I'm going to say more about that a little bit later. She milked the family's cow or two, and she made cheese and churned the butter in the kitchen. And when I get to the part about talking about the dairy industry, you'll see how important that was. With their variety of tasks, keeping them busy from sunup to sundown, pioneer women were even more tied to the farmstead than were the men. And these farmsteads were isolated. Even when I was growing up, our nearest neighbor was a half a mile away. Some of these farmsteads, well, on the pioneer days, were, were miles away. So a little bit about the early homes uh, and during the pioneer days. A new settler's first settler, I got to turn off my cell phone. The, um, uh, a new settler's first shelter was likely to be a hastily erected dwelling, sometimes little more than a hut. Benjamin Hellback and his wife claimed that uh, claimed 80 acres in the township of East Troy in 1845, and there they cut timber from the property to build a log cabin and stopped the crevices with clay. The floor was made of slabs hewn until they would be level, and they were kept clean by means of a splint broom. One half of the attic was floored with slabs to which they ascended by means of a ladder, and this furnished the sleeping apartments of the cabin. An anonymous writer from Richland County wrote the following about pioneer life in the 1860s in Richland County. Nearly all the homes on the farms were constructed of logs. Wood was a plentiful thing, and thousands of great oak, hard maples, and black walnut trees were cut down. Many of the cabins had but two rooms, and if family conditions required more, 
Partitions of rough boards and, times, and sometimes space for beds were merely curtained off with cheap cloth. Windows were not all glass, but frequently a piece of white muslin was stretched over a frame, oiled and placed in the window frame. They let in the light, but of course there was no peeking through the window to see who he was passing by. In most of the cabins, a big fireplace was built in one end with a flat stone for a hearth. And a cabin in the cabin, there was a big black bear skin in front of it for a rug. This was a report from Richland County. The fireplaces were wide and they took a lot of wood. A big log or oak or maple was rolled in and smaller pieces piled in front of it and surely made a cheerful fire and crackled and snapped at a great rate. But when the fire went out, a oh, hole, and it's 20 below zero, surely some families did all of their cooking in the fireplace. No stoves often in those very early pioneer days. Having cranes and hooks on which to hang the kettles and a reflective oven to do the baking. These, these irons were made of sheet metal, a uh, sheet iron and so arranged that it, that it could be set in front of the fireplace and the heat reflected into the oven until it became hot enough to bake the bread. Matches were not that common. And so in those days, they had to keep the fireplace going. Live coals in the fireplace. And if they died out, can you imagine this? Some member of the family would have to go to a neighbor to get a live coal so they could start the fire again in the fireplace. The mother of a family made all of the clothing, both underwear and outer garments, knitted the socks, stockings, and mittens as well. With cooking, keeping the cabin neat, making and mending clothes, washing, making soft soap, tallow candles, and butter, looking after the babies, she had little time for anything not connected with the needs of the family. And now let's move ahead just a little bit to the era in Wisconsin when wheat was king. And this started in the late, um, oh, in, the, in, in probably the mid 1840s. We became a territory in 1836, stayed in 1848. There was not a lot of settlement uh, prior to 1848. There was some, and most of it was in southeastern Wisconsin. If you draw a line on the Fox River, Wisconsin River, southeast of that, that's where most of the settlement was. Uh, in 1838, I have a map in my book that illustrates that. But the dairy industry was non-existent. Can you believe this? Now, Wisconsin, by 1862, which is the middle of the Civil War, Wisconsin was number two in wheat production in the nation. Number one happened to be Illinois. See, the Western states had not yet even come into existence, North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, Nebraska. That, that was still into the future. So the major wheat growing states were here in, in the Midwest. So in the 1840s to the 1870s, that's when wheat growing was a predominant agricultural pursuit in this country. And the few cows that there were, as I mentioned earlier, there might be two or three cows on a farm. They were considered women's work. These macho men who planted hundreds, really hundreds of acres of wheat, depending on the size of their operation, they, they could not see themselves taking care of those smelly cows. So it was the women's work to take care of the cows, to feed them and bed them. And interestingly enough, they arranged things for the breeding of the cattle so that they're, they, they didn't milk in the wintertime. I mean, who would want to milk a cow in the wintertime, for heaven's sakes? So they only milked in the spring and the summer and the fall. And the wintertime, uh, they didn't milk. Well, the women, they cared for the cows. They made the butter and the cheese in the kitchen. And lo and behold, by the late 1870s into the, late, into the 1880s, wheat growing began to fail. Now today we know better about how to grow crops than they did then. I hope at least we do. 
And what they did, they would plant wheat on the same patch of ground year after year after year. And anyone who knows anything about agriculture knows that if you do that, especially with any, without any kind of fertilization, there weren't any cattle to provide manure. They didn't know anything about commercial fertilizer yet. The soil began to, as we used to, my dad used to say, would, would begin to run out, meaning it, had, it lacked nutrition for a crop to grow. And besides that, a, a, an insect, the chinch bug came in and it literally ruined the wheat crop. And now these macho wheat farmers saw themselves at a crossroad. What in the world are they going to do for a living? Well, some of them moved on to the West because they were enamored, enamored with wheat growing. And so they went on to Kansas, Nebraska, and so on to grow wheat. But most of them liked it here in Wisconsin. And so they were searching for a new way of making a living. And we had all kinds of things happening at that time. Hops growing, that became popular. We were a big beer state by then. If you saw my book, Breweries of Wisconsin, I talk about the brewing industry and how hops, especially in counties like Salt County, Baraboo area, that was a big thing. And they, they in central Wisconsin, where I grew up, potatoes became a, a, a crop. And in southwestern Wisconsin, in, um, in, in Vernon County, uh, tobacco became a, 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 an interesting crop. So these farmers were searching for a way to make a living. Well, a number of the early immigrants, early pioneers who came into Wisconsin came from New York State. And New York State for many years was the leader in the nation in dairy production, in cheese making, butter making, the whole schmear. They were the leading dairy state. And people like Hiram Smith moved here to Wisconsin. And, and people like William Dempster Horde, the founder of Horde's Dairyman magazine. Horde was committed to helping people, these macho farmers see, that there was a way of making a living with cattle. And the men who had been the wheat growers, they wanted nothing to do with Horde's message. He, William Horde traveled the state, talking to groups, he was governor at one time as well, uh, traveled the state talking to farmers about why, how they could make a living with cattle. And it took a long time. It took probably, well, it took more than 20 years. And why? Because it was this gender issue. Why, why should men be doing women's work for heaven's sakes? It was, it was, well, it just was unheard of. It would be in the same category as washing dishes and mending socks, is how some men would have seen taking care of cattle. Well, slowly, Horde's message took hold. And we saw by the late 1800s, the development of a, of a dairy industry in this state. And in the late 1800s, when we saw all these great barns, the beginning of all these great barns uh, being built around the state. And if you've seen my book, Barns of Wisconsin, I talk about the evolution of barn building in the state and how it was a reflection of how the population, the rural population, the farmers, were beginning to see that cattle, the dairy cattle, had a future. And if you're going to raise dairy cattle, if you're going to make a living, you're going to, have to do something with them in the winter time. You don't just let them huddle, huddle under a straw stack, which is what had been the case before. And so these big barns provided housing. And then we saw the introduction of crops like alfalfa and later silos came along, all of which to provide feed for the cattle. And I want to read you a little quote from a woman who was elated with the fact that now women were no longer responsible for carrying the cows, churning the butter, and making the cheese in the kitchen. The woman's name was, Eve, uh, was Mrs. E.P. Allerton, and she spoke at the, an annual meeting of the Wisconsin Dairymen's Association in 1875. And she wanted to make sure that the audience, which was mostly men, understood the women's viewpoint on cheesemaking, and here's what she said. In many farmhouses, 
the dairy work loomed up every year, a mountain that it took all summer to scale, that the mountain is removed, it has been hauled over to the cheese factory. And let us be thankful, time does not hang heavy on the hands of the farmer's wife now that it is done. She did not need the dairy work for recreation. <laughs> Well, her point was well made, well made. But the, 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 the interesting thing was the, the men, as soon as they discovered that they were going to have some responsibility for cheese making and butter making, they began building factories. I mean, if it, we're going to do it, men, we're not going to do it in the kitchen for heaven's sakes. We're going to do it big time. And so we saw the emergence of cheese factories springing up all over the state, all over the state. We saw, and, well, the southern part, the north is a whole nother story, the logging industry, and I talk about that in a different book. So now we've got the emergence of a new industry, but women's work still was an important, uh, uh, important, not only important, but a vital part of what was going on. I want to say just a word a bit a word or two about women and social life. Because one, with the farmers now with the cheese factory, the cheese factory became a, a, a social uh, place because men would line up with their, in those days there weren't any, uh, any uh, trucks all running around picking up milk, but you, you drove with your team and your milk to the cheese factory and you, and you sat in line waiting to, to dump your milk into the vats. And, and, and so farmers had a chance to talk to each other, but the women didn't. They were isolated at home. And let me just read a little bit what I wrote about that. Farm women were usually stuck at home, especially during the long winter months. They had little contact with other women in the neighborhood, except perhaps the occasional quilting bee, which my mother used to sponsor, or a card party or a neighborhood dance. And I can remember as a kid, going to neighborhood dances, which is really quite an interesting thing. And we had a little band in our, in our community. Uh, three guys, none of them could, could read music, but they, they could play very well. One played a, a, a fiddle, a violin, another played a banjo, another played a concertina, and they made just wonderful music. And I've never forgotten how important those three guys were to our community, especially during the depression years of 1929 up to 1940. So the Sunday morning church services, that was another avenue for the women. But interestingly enough, and some of you will smile at this, but about this time, telephones became available in the rural communities. The party line telephone by the 1890s preceded electricity, preceded radio, of course, television, and all the rest. And if you had a party line telephone, which we did at home, the party line telephone allowed the women, and my mother was in charge of the telephone. We could not go near the telephone, but when it rang, and those of you who are familiar with the party line telephone, each person might be 10, 12 people on the line, each one had each person had their own ring, and ours was a long and three shorts, and the neighbors with three shorts, and so on. But you not only went to the telephone when your ring came in, but you went to the telephone when anybody else's came in, and that's how women kept track of what was going on in the community. And it sounded like they shouldn't do it, but I would suggest that that became one of the social outlets for women as they could keep track of what was going on. And the phone, I, I must say, was vital for a lot of reasons beyond the, the social part of it. Because I can remember so clearly one time when our, when our barn was about to blow over from a fierce straight windstorm. And I can remember getting up in the morning and coming downstairs and my mother is screaming into the telephone, my, our barn is, blowing over, our barn is going over. And what happened was that a general ring went out to everyone in the area. Ding, 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 ding. 
And you knew if you heard the, the uh, general ring that somebody was in trouble. A barn was going over, somebody got hurt in an accident, whatever it was. And you rushed to that place. And in our instance, this was in 1950, uh, uh, within an hour or two, we had about 100 people at our farm helping to save our barn from tipping over. The telephone was a vital part of everyone's existence, and especially for women. And I will never forget the story. We, we had friends from, from uh, Illinois, from Chicago, that would come out to our farm. Why in the world they would want to come out there for two weeks escapes me because we had no electricity, no indoor plumbing, we heated our house, we had stove, we had, we had nothing. And yet they would come out to the farm and what, they would call ahead of time from Chicago. <clears throat> and a long distance call was a modern day miracle. But when they would call, my mother would go to the phone and the operator, there were real people in those days, the operator would say, long distance call. My mother would lap her hand over the mouthpiece and say to the family, my brothers and me and my dad, Sheesh, there's a long distance call. And she would stand up to her, to her five foot two and in the loudest voice possible, she would say, hello, my gosh, you could hear her in Fond du Lac without the telephone. The party line telephone was vital to farmers' lives and especially to the lives of women. And it was in the 1920s that radio came along and that added another very important dimension. And now I wanna, I wanna switch gears just a little bit and move us up to 1940. 1940, I was a kid. I was in, attending a one room country school and I want to share a little bit about my mother's role during a year, the year of 1940. Now the situation, the depression was in its waning moments. Prices were low, challenges were many, and, and farm people were tired. They were exhausted. Many of them had lost their farms because they couldn't pay the taxes. They couldn't make the mortgage payments. The Depression was an awful time. I was born in the middle of it, and I have a lot of personal stories about it. Our home farm was uh, four miles west of Wild Rose in Wishara County. And as I mentioned, we had no electricity, no indoor plumbing, two wood stoves. I was in second grade at a one-room country school in 1940. My mother's education, seventh grade. My dad's education, fifth grade. Neither one had graduated. Neither one had graduated from uh, eighth grade. And that was not uncommon because in those days when you were big enough to work, your folks would pull you out of school and put you to work. And that was both my mother and my father's experience. The social opportunities for my mother in 1940, weather permitting, we would go to town, Wild Rose, on Saturday night in summer and Saturday afternoon in winter. And my mother, in, in this language, I, when I share it with people think, well, what's this guy talking about? My mother would go to town and do her trading. She said, what is you, what are you talking about? What are you trading? She was tra literally trading eggs for groceries because she was in charge of the chicken flock. She was in charge of gathering the eggs and she was trading eggs for groceries which was, I think, kind of interesting. On Tuesday nights, we had a free movie in Wild Rose. And we sat outside on the banks of the Wild Rose Mill Pond, watching movies on a, on a bed sheet that was strung all, uh, on a big old willow tree. And that was wonderful. I remember that so very well. And then there was church on Sunday, but not always. My mother organized quilting bees. And we occasionally had these dances that I'd mentioned with these, with these, free, uh, th these three musicians in the community. So a birthday party would be a dance party, so to speak. And it would die in the homes, you'd push all the furniture aside and they would dance in the dining room and dance in the living room. Uh, I've never forgotten that. There were polka dances and, and shottishes and, and so on. Now, my mother's year round jobs, she was cooking and baking on a wood stove. Can you imagine that? Cooking and baking on a wood stove. And if you want to see more about that, and I, I'm just a commercial now, 
Uh, I have uh, my daughter, Susan, and I wrote a book called Old Farm Country Cookbook. And it's all about the recipes from my mother's cooking on a wood stove, wood stove recipes. It was, it's, as I look back on it now, it's amazing what she was able to do with the wood stove. Women in those days with wood stoves not only had to know how to cook and how to bake, but they had to know the quality of different kinds of wood. Oak wood held the fire better, pine wood started flashing more quickly, and so on. We had a ringer washing machine, and it did have a gasoline engine that never started. My, I learned a whole new language of cuss words from my dad as he was trying to start the washing machine, especially in the wintertime. And, and my mother would hang the clothes out to dry all seasons of the year on clotheslines. And I've never forgotten, in the dead of winter, the clothes would literally freeze dry. <laughs> And she would bring the overhauls into the house and, and stand them up around in the kitchen. And when, you would when I'd come home from school, it looked like we had a bunch of visitors. But then they didn't have any heads. <laughs> they just had bodies. <laughs> and, and then you'd, you'd watch as, as, they, the, the, as they would dry, uh, as the, the, they warmed up, then they would sort of crinkle down into a pile. Those are all kinds of memories about, like that. My mother then would iron on Tuesdays. With a, with a sad iron, I have one here someplace, I should have brought it along to show you, uh, which was heated on the wood stove. And then she mended the clothes, she darned the socks. I talked to kids, I used to do a lot of that. And it's not kids said, why in the world would your mother want to cuss at the socks? I said, she wanted cussing at the socks. She was filling in the holes by stitching, a little cross stitching. She was in charge of the chicken flock. She gathered the eggs each day. She was in charge of the vegetable garden. She was in charge of family health. Our nearest doctor was 12 miles away. Hospital was 40 miles away. She was in charge of the bookkeeping on the farm. And when my mother passed away in 1993 and we were cleaning out the house, I found her account books. What a marvelous story was in those account books because she wrote down every nickel of income, and sometimes that's the level that was that they were earning, and every bit of expense. And I wrote a whole book about that, based on an account book. Every farm tells a story, is the name of the book. It was just a fascinating way of seeing how things changed over the years, from the Depression years when the prices were so terrible, to World War II when the prices came up a little bit, and so on. Uh, she was, um, well, she was also responsible for, well, she used that money. Let me come back to the egg money. She used that money not only to buy, to trade for groceries, but she used it to buy Christmas presents and our clothes. And how joyful it was, this sounds so weird today, how joyful it was to get a new pair of bib overalls about twice a year once before the Christmas program, and once when you started school in the fall. New pair of bib overalls. And my mother would be aghast if she saw someone wearing a pair of blue jeans with a hole in the knees. You would say, for heaven's sakes, we got to patch that hole. And now you pay big bucks for a pair of pants with a hole in the knee. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the change of the times. My mother prepared lunch for me every day as I trekked off to school, and she took care of my twin brothers who were three and a half years younger than I. Now, through the, to, to, to walk through the months to give you some sense. In January, in addition to all the other things I've mentioned, she ordered the garden vegetable seeds. And what a wonderful thing that was. I would watch her sit by the wood stove in the kitchen on a cold winter day when the wind is whistling around the house and the snow is blowing and she's got a big smile on her face because she's looking at tomatoes and sweet corn and radishes and so on. And she's thinking about the garden that we'll plant in April. So that's one of the things that she did in addition to washing clothes and all the rest of it. In February, she would order the chicks, the little baby chicks, order them from a nursery in southern Wisconsin someplace, 
And we, the, when, the, when the depot agent would, would call and say, your chicks are here, I would go with my dad along to the, to the depot and there would be a pile of boxes of chicks and they're chirping away. I've never forgotten that. We'll come back to that in a little bit. My mother might have a quilting bee in February with a quilt frame set up in the dining room. I've never forgotten that. All the women sitting around it, sewing, but also chatting, a social event. My mother would also help our teacher. We had one room, one teacher was in all eight grades in one room with the Valentine program. I've never forgotten that in February. Walking down to school, we were a mile from the school to help the teacher with the Valentine program. In March on St. Patrick's Day, the day that was green in my mother's mind, she started tomato seeds, tomato plants, and cabbage seeds, put them in a, in a warm place where the sun shines through the kitchen window. Uh, I've, I, I still do that. And, and I've been gardening for forever. I, I still do that. St. Patrick's Day was the day to do that. In April, I can remember, we had 20 acres of potatoes. That was our cash crop during that time. Spending evenings, my mother, a part of this, cutting the potatoes, meaning cutting them so that each little piece had, a, had an eye on it so it would, would grow. And she, in, in April, we'd plant the potatoes in our garden as well and set out the cabbage plants, plant the leaf lettuce, plant the radishes. And we would cut the first rhubarb in April. She would air out the bedding, take the winter's bedding and out pound the bejeebers out of the, we had a, a quilt pounder, the dust would fly and hang those on the clothesline and air everything out because spring was coming and we knew spring was here for sure when we moved the stove from the dining room out into the woodshed for the rest of the year. We did all that in April. And then May, by mid-May, depending on the weather, we planted the rest of the garden. Uh, my mother again in charge, this goes there, this goes there. She was in charge of all of that. And by late May, we were eating leaf lettuce, oh, leaf lettuce with some special uh, dressing. I, we've got the recipe in our cookbook uh, that I've never forgotten. It, we called it good stuff. And it was really good. And it was the, t we, we could taste spring. I have a, the first lettuce was the, it was the taste of spring. And then there was asparagus to be cut. We had a lot of asparagus growing. By June, we were, we were harvesting strawberries and my mother was canning everything. She was canning strawberries. She was, she was um, canning beets. She was canning, canning almost all the vegetables, carrots. And, and when the strawberries were in, were, were, were in season, we, we ate strawberries three times a day. Oh, what a wonderful time that was. <laughs> three times a day for strawberries. By July, we were harvesting and my mother was canning green beans and peas and black raspberries that we picked wild in the woods and red raspberries that we grew. And by August, we were harvesting potatoes, the early potatoes and sweet corn. She canned sweet corn. And the thrashing crew, I've got a, stories about that in my books. That was a part of women's work in August when the thrashing crew, and I worked on one, went from farm to farm. And the women competed with each other to provide the very best meals, and they were. They were right up there with Thanksgiving meals. But they not only competed with each other, but they helped each other. It, it was a really interesting thing. So the, the thrashing was a kind of a social event for the farmers, the men, and, and for the women who were helping each other. By September, we were harvesting the cabbage, and we were a German family, so sauerkraut was a big deal. We were making a huge crock of sauerkraut. You come into our house in wintertime, the first thing you smell is the, is the smoke from the stove, and the second thing you smell is sauerkraut. And anyway, it was a big old five-gallon crock. And when the style of filling, a filling crew would come by, similar to the uh, threshing crew, Anyway, by October, the rest of the garden was harvested, the onions and squash and the rutabagas and the late potatoes and the shredding crew. We didn't have a corn picker or anything like that. We cut the corn with a corn binder and shocked it into shocks and hauled the shocks to the, to the farmstead when the, th when the corn shredding crew came by that separated the, the ears from the, from the stalks. And now by November, 
My mother is preparing the house for winter. She closed with my dad. We closed off uh, most of the house because we just had two stoves to heat it. So much of the house was closed off uh, and left behind was the kitchen and the dining room and one bedroom and the bedroom we had upstairs from my brothers and me was heated with a stove pipe from the dining room stove and the stove would go out at midnight and oh my gosh, it was cold in the bedroom. We also butchered a pig in March and my mother again in charge of, of canning pork. And I've never forgotten a half, a half of a big carcass laid out on the kitchen table and my dad and mother with big old knives are cutting up this pig into pork chops and pork loins and all the rest of it. December, ordering the Christmas presents from the Sears Roebuck catalog. Egg money went for the Christmas presents. And then preparing a very special meal for Christmas. On Christmas Eve, that very special meal of oyster stew which we still to this day offer our family. And it was my folks and my grandparents and my great grandparents from Germany who all had oyster stew on Christmas Eve. And my mother would bring up from the cellar over, she, the, the shelves were lined with her canning goods and she would bring up canned meats and vegetables and berries. And we would have a wonderful meal on Christmas day. And so that's a little bit about my mother's role as a farm woman, which was not that different from what the pioneer women experienced many years earlier. I'm gonna stop now and see what questions you may have, and I'll, uh, I'll try to answer them for you. Okay, thanks, Jerry, that was, that was wonderful. Um, we had a lot of really great comments in the chat and a lot of people um, kind of reiterating what you said about your mom um, referring to grocery shopping as trading. So I thought that was interesting. I hadn't heard that one. Um, we didn't have too many questions, just one. Um, in the early frontier years, 1840s, etc., with all the chores that children are responsible for, um, how were they taught to read and write? I'm assuming that was mother's role if she was, if she was also literate. That's a very interesting question because I, I've also uh, written the history of one room country schools. And one of the very first things that a community of pioneers would do is they would organize a church and they would organize a country school. And it was the country school's responsibility for teaching uh, reading and writing. Uh, so I don't, there may have been some cases where a, where a pioneer family was absolutely isolated someplace and it was far too, uh, the distance was far too great to a school. But most of the time uh, we had, Wisconsin was very good about that. The, the idea of a one room country school, we had several thousand of them in the state at one time. And, and they, they came very early. Uh, generally speaking, by the time we got to the dairy industry going, when a village would, would start, uh, they, they would start, there would be a church and a school and a tavern, uh, depending on what nationality was there. Uh, that, 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 that was it. That, and, and there was a, maybe a little grocery store or something like that. So, but that's a, that's a very interesting question. And uh, a, another side of it, uh, even though the basics were taught at the One Room Country School, it was the women who were helping the children when they were home doing their homework. And let me give a personal, a, a share a personal experience. Some of you, some of you know that I had polio in, in 1947 and I spent about two months out of school at home. And my teacher, oh bless her, Mrs. Face Jinx was her name. She brought out my, once I was able to be out of bed, she brought my lessons out each day. I was in eighth grade. Uh, lessons out each day, and my mother made sure that I did them. She helped me with them. Because in those days, when you were in eighth grade, you had to pass a countywide examination before you could go into high school. And I was worried stuff that I would not pass the exam because I wasn't, wasn't in school. And my mother made sure that I did. My dad helped too. And I'll, I'll, I'll use this language that would be foreign to a lot of you. But oranges came in wooden crates in those days. And my dad made a desk for me out of two orange crates 
standing on end with a board across the top. When I was able to be up, there I sat, one leg crippled, I couldn't walk, paralyzed. But I'm looking out the window at the cows in the pasture and doing my lessons on this little desk that my dad made. And my teacher, Mrs. Jenks, Oh, every day she would come by and leave the lessons and pick up what I'd worked on and got me through it. And lo and behold, I passed the exams and went off to high school. Great. Um, there's one more question that two people have brought it up. So I'm just going to read that off. And I think that's all we'll have um, time for. But um, just could you comment on the role of the um, agricultural grange, granges in Wisconsin and the role they played in um, socialization and uh, community events? Sure. The, the, the Granger uh, pre predates Farm Bureau and Farmers Union and NFO. Uh, they, they were an early organization of farm people that had both an educational purpose and sharing of ideas. Farmers were still are. They were very good about sharing with each other what they were doing and how they were doing it. And the, and the Grange helped fil facilitate that as long as well as providing a, a social opportunity for people. M most every uh, village uh, in, the, in the early days had a, had a Grange Hall. There, there's still, a, if, you, um, if you look at Wisconsin history books, you, you, you can find a, a, where these are. There were a bunch of them around. So the Grange, the Grange and the Grangers, as they were called, were very important. They also, beyond locally, uh, they were very instrumental in helping farmers get RFD, rural free delivery, that's the mail coming around. And they also worked to, to, to lower the rail uh, rates that were exorbitant at one time. And, and rail was very important in moving wheat around during those wheat years. So the, the, the Grange was an important organization. Okay, well, I think that's um, all we have time for. There are really a lot of awesome um, comments. Uh, people are very thankful for kind of bringing us back um, to the good old days and um, just kind of- They weren't all that good, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, people just remembering stories that they heard, um, they heard from their, their grandparents. So uh, thank you very much, Jerry, uh, for kind of taking us back today. So- sure, good. And, and good luck to everyone, S stay well. And um, keep up with our history is very important. It, and one of the things I tell, I've taught workshops about all these lines all the time. I say to my students, you don't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. And that's where history comes in. Very true. Awesome. Well, before people hop off, we do have a final evaluation poll. Uh, we like to collect data just to know who's attending. Um, it is all anonymous, so I'm going to um, bring up our evaluation and demographics poll. If you would all take a second to fill that out and then we'll have a short wrap up. Again, uh, your responses are anonymous. So we'll give you a minute or two for that and then Jenny's gonna take over. Maybe 15 more seconds for the evaluation. Okay. Okay, thanks everyone for, um, for filling that out. It really helps us with our programming. So Jenny, do you wanna do the wrap up? 
you're muted right now. Thanks, Lee. Yep. And thank you, especially Jerry. I really enjoyed the presentation a lot. And as someone commented on in the chat box, history is delightful. You really did a nice job kind of talking about the, the transition from wheat to dairy and the importance of women as they have always been within the, uh, the Wisconsin's dairy industry as well as agricultural as a whole. So thank you very, very much. I hope everybody else enjoyed it too. So if you haven't already, there is still plenty of time to join and sign up for the rest of the coffee chats. Again, they are on the second Monday of every month through March 8th. And we have topics ranging from the pre-holiday stress, which will be coming up in December, that will be presented by some county county educators through the state. So come and get some tips on how to deal with that. And we will also be running another raffle there for two American Dolls for the, on that one as well. And then we have um, Gary Saporsky talking about tax preparation, just kind of getting you ready for the tax season. That will be in January. March is how to read and understand the components on your milk check, where, where are all those premiums coming from, et cetera. And then we will finish off the season March 8th with Jenny Gavin, who's um, a farmer, and she does, they do a lot of direct marketing and added value, and she'll be just kind of going over how to do some branding on that. So to register, you can go to the URL is up here. You can also find it on the Heart of the Farm website, as well as the Heart of the Farm Facebook page. We will have some other um, flashes on the Facebook page. You can also contact your local um, UW-Madison Division of Extension office or myself. So there are plenty of ways to find out more about the program and to register it. And once, regi once you register, you'll receive meeting information for all of them. You can sign up for all of them at the same time or just the ones that you're interested in. So with that, I would like to just thank you all once again for joining us today and Jerry and all of your comments. And I hope that everybody enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the beautiful day. Yeah.